Let's turn in the Word of God, please, to the book of Genesis and the chapter number 45. The book of Genesis and the chapter number 45. While you're turning to the place, can I just thank you once again for uh, your prayers for us as a family and for our recent trip out to Guinea there during the summer. And uh, we know that you were praying for us and uh, we had the hand of God upon us in so many different ways. Good for Rachel and the children to get back again to uh, where our children grew up and to where they had many, many memories. And it was a, a tremendous blessing to have them with me this time rather than going by myself. We were able to have a consultant check of the Gospel of John and the book of Colossians, and those have been now approved for printing. And so we praise God for his help and encouragement as we continue to see the Word of God translated into the language of the bag of people. And I am planning, uh, God willing, to go out again myself in November for three weeks, and we're going to have another consultant check of some of the epistles of the New Testament. So we'd appreciate uh, your prayers for that, but I believe I'm back again next month, uh, so we'll give you uh, an update uh, before we go. So let's turn uh, to Genesis chapter 45, and we'll commence to read at the verse number 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt, Come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household, and all that thou hast, come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen. And ye shall make haste, and bring down my father hither. And move down to verse 24. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons with which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's just bow for a brief word of prayer. And let's just still our hearts in the Lord's presence and ask him to speak to us and to our hearts from his word. Lord, we thank Thee once again for Thy precious Word, for the Gospel, for the truth of the Gospel, 
We thank you, Lord, for the pieces that already have been sung to us and for the, piece, the, the, the hymns that we have sang together as a congregation in our worship tonight. And we thank you now for the precious Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for thy truth. We thank you, Lord, for the glorious message of the gospel that there is a Savior from all sin, a Savior who's able to save and to deliver and to set free, a Savior who's longing to save men and women, even in this very meeting tonight. And Father, I pray for just a fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost upon me now as I stand before this congregation with the great responsibility of delivering thy word, of standing here between the living and the dead to proclaim Christ and to invite sinners to come to thee. Lord, I ask for help. I ask for the speaking voice of God. I have no help in myself. Lord, prepare every heart just now to hear thy voice. Shut out the distractions. Help us, Lord, to beyond the voice of the preacher, to hear the voice of the Spirit of God, the voice of Christ himself calling to himself. Lord, hear and answer prayer. Abide with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Joseph is one of the most outstanding characters in the Old Testament. Indeed, he's one of the most noble and purest characters in, in all of Scripture. The Scripture reminds us that the Lord was with Joseph. And what a, a powerful thing that is to, there's no greater thing really on earth than to have it to be said of us that the Lord is with us. What, what an inscription to have placed on your tombstone. The Lord was with him or the Lord was with her. It was also said of Joseph by a godless king, can we find such an one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? What a testimony to have before the world. And surely it's something whenever the world can look at us tonight and look at our lives and can say of us, there's a man, there's a woman, there's a young person in whom is the Spirit of God. There's a person and I see God in them. F.B. Meyer says, let us ponder the story of Joseph, for in doing so we shall get a foreshadowing of him who was cast into the pit of death and who now sits at the right hand of power, a prince and a savior. Most of us, and not all of us in this meeting tonight, are familiar with the story of Joseph. And the life of Joseph is a wonderful foreshadowing of the life of the Lord Jesus. Indeed, someone has counted no less than 125 similarities between uh, the life of Joseph and that of Christ. And whenever we come to this 45th chapter here in uh, Genesis 45, which uh, is the account of Joseph revealing himself uh, to his brothers after all of those years, we have a wonderful picture here of the Lord Jesus and our response to him. And it's that that I want us just to consider together in this gospel meeting tonight. Firstly, I want us to consider here the revelation. The revelation. We have Joseph here revealing himself to his brothers. And there's a number of things that he reveals here. A number of things that are revealed here. First of all, we have in verse 4 the revelation of a guilty past. The revelation of a guilty past. Verse 4 says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Notice that one of the first things that Joseph does whenever he reveals himself to his brothers here is to remind them of their guilty past. He reminded them of their evil deed in selling him all of those years ago to those Midianite merchant men out of envy and jealousy. Joseph doesn't try to cover up their guilty past. He doesn't try to pretend that they had never committed this evil deed against him. He uncovers it. He 
reveals it. He brings it before them. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye stole into Egypt. He reminded them of their guilty past. Whenever the Lord Jesus reveals himself to you, dear friend, one of the first things he will do is to reveal to you your guilty past. And every one of us in this meeting tonight has a guilty past. Or you may not have committed any terrible crimes. You may be a young person in this meeting, indeed a child in this meeting tonight, and it's good to see the young people here. You may be a child in this meeting tonight, and of course you've never murdered anyone. Of course you've never robbed anyone. You've never committed any terrible crimes. But dear friend, the reality is that every one of us, no exceptions, we are all born guilty into this world. We all have a guilty past. God's verdict on all mankind is found in Romans 3 and verse 19, where it says that every mouth is stopped and all the world is guilty before God. That includes you, my dear friend. And sadly, there are many people up and down our land, even this very day, who are trying by their good works, by their church attendance, to try and deal with their guilty past. They think that by doing good works, by trying to live a good, upright, moral life, that by trying to faithfully attend church every Sunday, by these various means they're seeking to deal with their guilty past, they somehow think that if they just do enough good deeds and do enough things to please God, that somehow their guilty past, their sinful guilty past, will just be overlooked by God and, and all will be well. My dear friend, if you are going to be saved, you need to face up to your guilty past. Others are like Joseph's brothers here, and they never face up to their guilty past. They never face up to it. They just live their lives going through life and never really face up to the fact that they have a guilty past, that they stand as guilty sinners before an all-holy God. And I trust if you're in this meeting tonight, and it is my prayer for you tonight, that if you're not saved, maybe up until this point you've been going through your life and maybe you attend this place on, on the Lord's Day and the Lord's Day evening, but up until this point, you have never faced up to your guilt before God. You think that you're not so bad a person. You think you're a good, upright person. And maybe in the eyes of people, you are. But my dear friend, in God's eyes, you have a guilty past. And you must face up to that guilty past if you're ever going to be saved. We don't preach an easy believism come to Jesus and, and, and they just forgive you and all will be well. My dear friend, when you come to Christ, as you must, when you come to him, just like Joseph revealing himself to his brothers here, when Christ reveals himself to you, whenever you come to him, one of the first things he will do is to reveal to you your guilt. He will make you keenly aware that you stand as a guilty sinner before God. You cannot gloss over that fact. You cannot ignore that fact. If you're going to be saved, if you're ever going to be in God's heaven, you've got to face your guilt before God. Not only do we have here the revelation of a guilty past, but we also have the revelation of a tender compassion. The revelation of a tender compassion. Look at the second part, or the first part of verse 2. As Joseph is with his brothers here about to reveal himself to them, it says, and he wept aloud. And he wept aloud. Joseph wept as he revealed himself to his brothers here. Oh, the pent-up emotion that was in the, the heart of Joseph as, as he had been dealing with his brothers here all along. And here he releases all of that emotion uh, and he weeps. My dear friend, in this meeting on Sea of Tonight, I want you to know that the Lord Jesus cares so much for your soul that he weeps over you tonight. He longs that you might be saved. 
He longs that you might face up to that guilty past of yours. He longs that you might come to him, that you might surrender your life to him, that you might repent of those sins of the past, that you might come in brokenness to him. And dear friend, he, he longs so much that you might come to him and be saved, that, that, that he weeps over you. He doesn't want you to perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Dear friend, he wants you to be saved tonight, so much so that he, he weeps over you. His, his heart is filled with a tender compassion. Look at the Lord Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem, that city that had rejected him, that city that had known about him from their scriptures, and yet were rejecting him as Christ sits there upon the Mount of Olives as he looks over that city, as he looks over a people that, that know about him but are rejecting him, that that they refuse to come to him, see him, his, his heart is filled with a tender compassion for them. He didn't write them off. He, his heart was filled with a tender compassion. He, he cries as, he, as he's there with, uh, uh, looking over them. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thee as a hen gathers its chicks under his wings, but ye would not. O oh, see the the, 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 the compassion of Christ for his, for his own people as they live without him and reject him and refuse to come to him. Oh, dear friend, tonight can you see the heart of the Lord Jesus for you? Can you see that heart of tender love and compassion for you? He longs to save you. You may be here tonight. You may have little concern for your soul. You may be racing through life, doing the things that you do, following the pursuits of this world. You may have little concern about where your soul is going to spend the ages of eternity. You may be careless to that solemn fact tonight, but let me tell you, the Lord Jesus is not careless as to where you're going to spend your eternity. He longs that you might have a concern in your soul for your salvation, that you may come to him even tonight. The revelation of a guilty past, the revelation of a tender compassion. Thirdly, we have the revelation of a real kinmanship. Verse 4, Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph, your brother. I am Joseph, your brother. These words must have fell upon the ears of his brothers like a thunderbolt. This was Joseph, their brother, they had been dealing all along with their long-lost brother. It is no wonder that they were troubled at his presence here. Dear sinner friend, the Lord Jesus says to you tonight, I am Jesus, Jesus, your brother. I am bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. I came into this world. I took to myself human nature just like yours apart from sin. I know what it's like to live in this sinful world. I know what it's like to face temptation and to face evil. I am Jesus, your brother. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15 reminds us, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he may destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. Christ took your human nature upon himself in order that he might go to Calvary's cross, there lay down his life, there to rise again from the dead, conquering Satan. And in doing so, he has conquered the fear of death for you because he has dealt with death itself and dealt with sin, which is the sting of death. Many of friends, we all fear death. Death is something that no one looks forward to. But my dear friend, unsaved in the meeting tonight, you have, if you think upon and meditate upon the reality of the fact that you're going to leave this world someday, 
Oh, there's a fear in your heart as you think of that. But oh, the Lord Jesus says to you tonight, I am your brother. I am not a savior who is away up in the sky somewhere totally unrelated to you. No, I came into this world. I took your human nature. I lived in this world. I know what it's like to face temptation and evil. I know what it's like to live in this world, but I have conquered death for you by my death and rising again. I am Jesus, your brother, the revelation of a real kinmanship. Not only that, we also have here the revelation of great grace. The revelation of great grace. Look at verse 5. Joseph says to them, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. In verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph tells his brothers here not to be grieved because they sold him into Egypt. He said it was God who had sent him there to save them from the famine. The Lord Jesus says to you tonight, I am Jesus whom ye sold and crucified. I was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, even though the hands have been wicked that crucified me. But if you're willing to repent, your sins can be blotted out. Oh, the grace of God as we consider this, friends. The grace, the unmerited favor of God shown toward us. You see, we were guilty of nailing Jesus Christ to Calvary's cross. Yes, my dear friend, we may, you may not have taken up that hammer literally that nailed the nails through the Savior's hands and feet, but it was your sin that nailed him there. It was those sinful thoughts, those sinful deeds, those sinful actions. It was every one of them that drove the nails through the hands and feet of the Savior. Yes, you and I are guilty of selling and crucifying the Lord Jesus. But it was not you that sent him there, but it was God. God sent him before you to save your lives by a great deliverance. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, the grace of God tonight. Folks, this is what the gospel is all about. This is what you need to realize tonight. You nailed Christ to the cross, but it was God who sent him there to save your life by a great deliverance. Look at the beginning of verse 5. But God, God had sent me before you to preserve life. God sent Christ to the cross to save us, even though we were responsible for nailing him there. Verse 7, it says, God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth. Friends, God sent his only begotten son to Calvary's cross. Why? So that from every tribe and people and tongue and nation in this world of ours tonight, there may be a people saved for the glory of God. God so loved the world. Every continent, every country, every culture, every, every language group, God sent Christ in his wonderful grace, love, and mercy, sent him for a lost, sinful world. Second part of verse 7 says, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. God sent Christ to the cross to save us by a great deliverance. My dear friends, whenever a man or a woman or a boy or a girl comes to know the Lord Jesus, it is a great deliverance. It's a deliverance from the power of Satan and sin. It's a complete transformation within. And how many in this meeting tonight can testify to the mighty and great deliverance that the gospel and Christ has brought to them? My dear friend, if you're not saved tonight, it's our prayer. 
that that mighty deliverance from sin, from Satan, from the power of, of, of Satan himself and hell, oh, that you might know that great deliverance through the wonderful grace of God in sending Christ to Calvary's cross. Oh, see the revelation of great grace. Not only do we have here the revelation, we also have in this account here the commission. The commission, because you see, Joseph gave his brothers a commission here. In the same way, Christ has given us as the church the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. What were Joseph's brothers commissioned here? Firstly, they were commissioned to go and proclaim that he is alive. Go and proclaim that he is alive. Verse 9, Haste ye and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Joseph's brothers were to go back to their father and to tell them that Joseph was alive. As far as Jacob was concerned, Joseph was dead. All those years ago, whenever his sons had come home with Joseph's coat of many colors, dipped in blood, covered in blood, whenever he cried that day, an evil beast hath devoured him, Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. From that day until this, Jacob thought that, that Joseph was dead. But the commission that Joseph sent his brothers with was to go and tell their father that he was alive. And this is the, commi the Christ's commission to us as his people, to go and to proclaim to this world that he is alive. Folks, we have a living Savior tonight. We have a Savior who is alive and alive forevermore. Christ the Lord is risen today. Sons of men and angels say, raise your songs and triumphs high. Sing ye heavens, thou earth reply. Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. We don't serve a dead Savior. We have a living Savior to present to you tonight, one who is alive. Not only were they to go and proclaim that he is alive, but they're also to go and proclaim that he is exalted. Look at verse 8. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. And the beginning of verse 13, it says, And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen. Joseph's brothers were to go and tell their father not only was Joseph alive, but that he was Lord of all Egypt. He was in a position of great power as ruler over all Egypt. And this is Christ's commission to his servants, to go and to proclaim that not only is Christ alive, but that he is exalted, that he is Lord over all. He is King of kings, and Lord of lords, he is Lord of all the earth. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. From the fight return victorious. Every knee to him shall bow. Hark those bursts of acclamation. Hark those loud triumphant chords. Jesus takes the highest station. Oh, what joy the sight affords. Crown him, crown him, King of kings, and Lord of lords, God hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. My dear friends, in spite of what we hear from religious people and leaders in these days, Jesus Christ is alive and he is Lord of all. And one day before him, every knee, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. My dear friend tonight, unsaved, it's absolutely imperative that you come before this living, exalted Savior, that you cast yourself before him and bow the knee before him tonight. If you don't do it tonight, one day you will. One day when it will be too late. 
Oh, I tell you tonight, he is exalted. He's Lord of all. In spite of what men may say, he is Lord of all, and you need to bow before him and make him the Lord of your life. Not only were they to go and proclaim that he is alive, that he's exalted, but they're also to go and proclaim his willingness to receive. Look at it again at verse 9. Haste ye and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Joseph's brothers were to tell their father that Joseph was willing to receive them. Not only was he willing to receive them, but he had even issued the invitation to him to come to him and to tarry not. Christ has commissioned us to proclaim his willingness to receive sinners. My dear friends, if the Lord Jesus was not willing to receive sinners, then I am wasting my time standing in this pulpit tonight. You're wasting your time sitting in this pew tonight in this church building But oh, the glory of the gospel is that we have a Savior to present to you who is willing to receive you. Willing to save you. Indeed, he has issued the invitation to you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My dear friend, he invites you. He he, he is willing to receive you. He invites you to come tonight, to forsake your sin, to Bow your knee in repentance before him. Come down unto me. Tarry not, was Joseph's commission to his brothers. Dear friend, tonight, why are you tarrying in your sin? Maybe you've heard the gospel so often. You've heard the invitation from this very pulpit. Perhaps many, many times you've sat in gospel meetings. You've sat in gospel missions. You've heard the invitation of Christ to come to him, but still you're tarrying. You're tarrying. You're, you're, you're holding back. You're refusing to come. You're perhaps putting it off to another day. You're, you're saying, I'll have another day. I'll have another time. Come down unto me and tarry not. Why are you tarrying when the arms of the Savior are stretched out to you tonight? He's willing to receive you. He's willing that to, to, to receive you into his fold and into his family. Oh, will you not see his willingness to receive a sinner such as you tonight? Sinners Jesus will receive. Sound this word of grace to all who the heavenly path may leave, all who linger, all who fall. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. Make the message clear and plain. Christ receiveth sinful men. They were also to go and proclaim his power to save and provide. Verse 10 to 11, it says, And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. Joseph's brothers were to go and to tell their father that Joseph was able to provide for them, able to provide for them from the famine. If they would come down, if he would come down to him, they would have the very best of the land of Egypt. Christ has commissioned us as his people, to go and to proclaim to the world his power to save and to provide. Not only is Christ willing to save, but he is able to save. By virtue of his infinite sacrifice on Calvary's cross, I tell you, he is able to save, able to save unto the uttermost, all who come unto him. If you come to him, not only will he save you, but he will give you the very best of heaven. Now, he doesn't promise you the best of earth. You come to Christ. You receive eternal life from his hand tonight. He doesn't promise you that you will have the best of earth. Indeed, you may very well have much to suffer for his name here in this world. We do not preach a prosperity gospel. Come to Christ and you're going to have health, wealth, and everything else. No, we're not promised earth's 
best or anything from this earth, but what we are promised is God's very best, heaven's best. We're pro- you're promised peace with God. You're promised the assurance of eternal life. You're promised a home in heaven. You're promised an eternal inheritance with all the people of God. Christ is able to save you, dear sinner friend, if you will come to him tonight. Millions have proved it, and you can prove it tonight. You'll come to him. Thirdly, we have here the reception. How did Jacob receive the commission that Joseph sent to him by his brothers? Firstly, we find in verse 26 that Jacob doubted. It says in verse 26, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. Whenever Joseph's brothers told their father that Joseph was still alive, that he was lord of all Egypt, their father would not believe them. He would not believe them. This was too good to be true. Maybe you're here tonight, and you've heard the gospel. You've heard of the that Christ is alive, that, he, that he's exalted, that he's willing to receive sinners, that he's able to save you. You've heard it all, but maybe you have your doubts about it all. Maybe you doubt as to whether Christ is really able to save you. Maybe you've done things in your past that no one else knows anything about, and maybe those things trouble you in your conscience. Perhaps some nights lying on your bed, those things come up before you, and and they trouble you deeply. Maybe you feel tonight that you're too bad for Christ to receive. You have have your doubts as to whether Christ is really able to save you. My dear friend, there's no need to doubt tonight. There was no need for Jacob to doubt here. He had the word of Joseph, and all he needed to do was to simply go to believe that word and to go and to prove it. Dear friend, you have the word of Christ tonight, And all you've got to do is to go and prove it. Prove that he is able to save you no matter what your past is, no matter how black your sins may be. He is able to save you if you'll come to him. No need to doubt. In verse 27, we have Jacob believing. It says, And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. He believed, he overcame his doubts, and he believed the word of Joseph. Christ says to you tonight, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, what is passed from death unto life. Dear friend, there is the word of Christ. The word of Christ to you tonight. And if you're going to be saved, you've got to simply believe the word of Christ. You've got to believe that whenever Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep, that he laid down his life for you, that you might be saved, You've got to believe that when Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, you've got to believe that he can give eternal life to you tonight. Yes, in this very meeting, if you call upon him and cast yourself at his feet as a repentant sinner, he is able to give you the gift of eternal life. Simply believe the word of Christ, friend. Then we have Jacob deciding Verse 28, and Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go go and see him before I die. Whenever Jacob believed the word of Joseph, he acted on his belief and he decided to come. You know, it's not enough just to say that you believe the word of Christ. You've got to act upon your belief. You must decide to leave and to forsake your sin to leave your old life and your sinful ways. You know, so many in these days profess to believe in Christ, but their lifestyles show otherwise. 
They have never forsaken their sin. Jacob had to leave the land of Canaan that he had become so accustomed to. He had lived there for many, many years. He had become settled there. It was a settled lifestyle for him. But for Jacob to know the blessing of meeting with Joseph again, he had to get up, leave that place that he was so accustomed to, go to a place he had never been to before in order to meet with Joseph. My dear friend, you have got to forsake your sin. That old lifestyle that you're so accustomed to, to by now, you've lived like this for years, living for the world, living for yourself. My dear friend, I want to tell you, if you're ever going to be saved, and I trust there is a concern within your soul tonight to be saved. And if you're ever going to be saved, it's not enough for you just to say that you believe in Christ, that you believe in His Word. You've got to prove that by forsaking your sin, turning your back upon the old life, truly repenting of all of your sin, and casting yourself at the feet of Christ. We're told the end there of verse 28 that Jacob said, I will go and see him before I die. My dear friend, you need to come to Christ before you die. We're all being reminded in these days the brevity of life, the uncertainty of life. Know how urgent it is, how incumbent it is upon you tonight, dear sinner friend, that while the breath is within your body, while the Spirit of God is speaking to you, oh, how imperative it is that you come to Christ before you die. For I tell you, when you draw your last breath, when you say goodbye to this world and everything that's familiar to you, when they lower your coffin into Mother Earth, when it's all over as far as this world is concerned for you, dear friend, it's all over. As far as salvation is concerned, there's no salvation after death. No, may God write upon your heart tonight the urgency, like Jacob here, he knew it was urgent if he delayed. Very soon he was getting old. Very soon he would die. And he never would see Joseph again if he didn't get up and go before he died. My dear friend, you will never see Christ in all his glory. You will never enter his beautiful, glorious heaven and spend eternity with him if you don't come to him before you die, before you dry your, draw your final breath in this world. May God help you. Dear sinner friend, if God is speaking to you tonight, don't delay. Don't delay. If you're troubled about your soul, if you see your sin tonight, Christ has revealed your guilt to you tonight. Oh, come to him. Like Jacob here, overcome your doubts and come to him. He'll receive you, he'll save you, and make you his own. May God give you the grace to come to him tonight.